All right, urology. This, I believe, is the final piece of the puzzle for everybody, okay? Um, this is where it's gonna put things together. Uh, stuff from AMP1, even from the, let's say, stuff before AMP1, when you learned about <coughs> transport or active transport, that's gonna come back. Diffusion, that's gonna come back. Electrolytes, that's gonna come back. As you've seen, aldosterone, ADH, endocrinology is going to come back. Even uh, this, when we deal with uh, calcium, it's going to come back because we have to know a little bit about bone, muscle with creatinine. So this is one that's the last piece of the puzzle that puts the whole thing together. It's been following through AMP1 and up until AMP2 that we've been doing, then you're going to finally see how this all comes together. Okay? Um, so let's look at the whole picture over here. All right, you yourself is energy, and that energy is in the form of ATP. So way back to your studies, okay? ATP is the energy. When you look at each other, you are looking at energy, and that energy is in the form of a solid. But it's energy, and that's what that is. If you don't make ATP, you're dead. So the two main ingredients to make ATP is what? What two things do you have to have a constant supply coming in to make ATP? Oxygen and glucose, just like this, okay? If you starve, you don't get glucose, you're dead. If you suffocate and you don't get oxygen, you're dead, okay? So you need to constantly make ATP. When you do, water and carbon dioxide are released from this. So let's look at this whole picture. Put your pencils down and let's just look at the whole picture of why I'm saying it's the whole picture. Here's your digestive system. You're going to bring food in over here and that's glucose. It's going to come in. Now the glucose needs to get into the cells, which is on the other side of the whole picture here. So this glucose is going to go into the bloodstream. It's going to sit there. So the heart is the part that's going to pump it. How do you get the glucose over to this side? The heart is going to pump the blood, so now this glucose can now be pumped over to where it needs to go. So you need the heart in circulation to do that. Now the cells over here, whatever they are, tissue, skin, whatever you want to say, now it has that glucose. All the other waste products from the digestive system that are solids will go out the poop scoop. Okay? Meanwhile, we got to now look at the respiratory system. It's going to have this constant supply of oxygen coming in. As oxygen comes in, it's going to sit there, but the heart needs to pump the oxygen to the cells. So now we have the cells containing the glucose and the oxygen. And they bring it inside the cell, and they bring it to one part of the cell that's going to make ATP, which is called what? What part of the cell is going to make mitochondria? Oh. The mitochondria is the part of the cell that's going to make the ATP, okay? When it does that, it's called cellular respiration. It's going to take the oxygen and glucose inside the cells and make the ATP. It's going to then give off the CO2, right? If you put gasoline into your car, you have this exhaust that comes out that you don't need. Well, that's what this is, carbon dioxide. We don't need that. But it's a gas that needs to be transported into the bloodstream, and it turns back to a gas, and we're going to let the waste product, carbon dioxide, go out the respiratory system, okay? So that's what's happening here. Meanwhile, as water is being made from ATP and all the other uh, metabolic uh, reactions that happen in your body, you're putting more water into your system. So now you're, you have an extra amount of water that's in your circulatory system with a lot of extra electrolytes that you just don't need. How are you going to filter that all out? Well, that's the missing piece of the puzzle. That's the excretory system or urology. All the extra water, all the extra electrolytes that you don't need in your body are going to go out into the excretory system. So you have water soluble stuff that goes out the excretory system or urology system. You have the water insoluble stuff, the solids going out the digestive system. And then you have gases that are going to be going out the respiratory. So you have liquids solids and gases all leaving your body also. It's the last piece of the puzzle that we got to talk about now. Okay? Sure, I don't have nervous system in there. If 
doesn't show up. Well, the nervous system is the supervisor to make sure that this factory doesn't think. Your favorite subject, immunology isn't up there, but immunology is to make sure that there's no viruses or bacteria that's going to interfere with this. Endocrine system, well, you know that those are going to be uh, other managers, so to say, of this factory to make sure that ADH and aldosterone does what it needs to do, bring sodium in or water out and whatnot. Okay? The only, the only system you really don't need to survive, and I know I'm going to get some flack on this, is the reproductive system. All right, reproductive is not going to matter about this whole thing. All right, oh, but I need reproduction. I need reproduction to to survive. Yeah, but you don't. You're not going to die from. It. Oh, I will. No, you're not going to die from it. But maybe, and I don't want to get too philosophical, but maybe that is the meaning of life: is to procreate and to bring our genes and pass it down to generation to generation to generation. And in order to do that, you've got to survive. So maybe this whole purpose here is to protect and to pass on your genes to the next generation. Who knows? All right? But I just want you to understand the whole thing here. And when I do your final exam, that's what it's going to be like. When we talk about ADH, is that part of the endocrine system? Is that part of the circulatory system? Is that part of the urology system? Well, it's part of everything because it takes part in all that. At the end of AMP2, you should have a full understanding of how the whole body works, how it interacts with all the different systems. And that's what that's all about. Okay? All right. So alternate names for the urology system, we call it the urinary system or the urinary tract, because the genital area is there, we also see it as a UG system, a urogenital system, and so forth. We also call it the excretory system. Okay? The urinary system, some of the functions, um, it's going to filter 200 liters of blood daily. Now, that does not mean you're going to pee out 200 liters. Keep in mind what 2 liters is. 2 liters is like a 2 liter soda. You've seen a 2 liter soda. And I'm saying that it's going to filter 200 liters of blood. That does not mean you're going to pee 200 liters. Okay? Otherwise, you'd be having a bladder like a hamster, and you're going to go back and forth throughout you know, the hour or two that we have lecture with. All right? You'll be doing that like 20 times. So what happens here is that 200 liters goes through the kidney. Only 1% of that actually goes in your pee per day. So we're looking at 1 to 2 liters, depending on the food that you're eating and the activity that you're doing throughout the day. But you're looking at 1 to 2 liters of urine that you produce that goes out your body per day. So that means that 99% of your blood that goes through the kidney and all the fluids and stuff is going to go back into the bloodstream. It's what we call gets reabsorbed. Okay? So it's going to filter 200 liters of blood, get the toxins out, any kind of metabolic waste that we don't want, excessive amount of water and electrolytes, ions, okay? It's going to regulate the volume and chemical makeup of your blood, okay? Um, it's also going to maintain blood pressure, as that you probably already guessed on that, water, electrolytes, and yes, I know your favorite subject, acid-base levels. We're going to get into those later, okay? It also is going to stimulate red blood cells um, uh, production because it releases a certain hormone, the kidney that's going to increase red blood cells uh, synthesis. What is that hormone? What hormone comes out of the kidney that's going to increase red blood cell formation? Erythropoietin, right, EPO, okay? It's also gonna uh, take part in activation of vitamin D. If you remember that in the skin, when you did skin in A and B1, uh, it's gonna activate vitamin D, which is going to be able to re uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's gonna be able to absorb the calcium from your diet much better when you have high levels of vitamin D. Alright, so let's talk about the anatomy of the urinary system. Okay? Luckily, there's only four structures or organs to worry about. That's it. Four, that's it. You got the two kidneys. And you got two tubes that go down from the kidneys into the urinary bladder, and then from the urinary bladder goes the outside wall called the urethra. And that's it. Now don't get me wrong, the kidney itself microscopically is very, very detailed. We'll go through that, it's something called a nephron. But there's only four there. The 
you have the two kidneys up here. What is this little structure up here called? What is this beige thing that's found above the kidney? Suprarenal gland, or also known as the adrenal gland. Okay? From good old endocrinology. You got the two kidneys, the two ureters that lead to the urinary bladder, and then the urinary bladder to the outside world. You have a tube called the urethra. Okay? So that's where the two are. You, if you do an x ray of it, you shoot a dye in there, you will actually see the kidneys having more like a, a an antler kind of thing. All right, we'll talk about that when we look at it, but that's what's happening over here. All right, um, so the kidneys, um, just, I'm gonna point, where do you think the kidneys are on, in your, uh, in the posterior portion of your back? Where, if I, I'm gonna make my finger go up. Tell me when to stop when you actually think the kidney is there. Right there, to there. It's right about here. Actually, half of the kidney, and the kidney's about this big. You can see it's four inches by two inches by one. But the kidneys themselves, uh, a portion of them, I'd say about at least half of them are actually covered by your ribs. They're much higher than what people think. They're not down here. A lot of laymen think they're down here, right by your buttock, right? No, they're much higher. So they're up there, all right? Um, the right kidneys are a little bit lower than the left because it's a massive... Uh, organ that's pushing it down, the liver, right? So it's going to be a little bit lower than that, okay? Um, so that's where the two are, all right? So there's the right one, right, just a little bit lower because of the, the liver there. And you can see on the posterior aspect, see about half of the kidney themselves are covered by the ribs, okay? When you do a cross-section of, um, of the belly, like through the belly button, you're going to see, here's the anterior view, here's the posterior view over here, here's your vertebra. You're going to see the two kidneys are found posterior to the peritoneal cavity. So this, therefore, kidneys are what we refer to as retroperitoneal organs, right? They're found behind the peritoneum, okay? So that's what I'm just trying to show you here. There's the inferior vena cava and the aorta that you'll see over there. You'll also see the costal vertebral angle. Don't let the word scare you. Costal meaning rib, vertebra meaning vertebra, and you'll see there's an angle right there. That's where the kidneys lie. And a lot of doctors and medical professionals, if they suspect that there's some kind of infection in the kidney, they're just going to, now they're not going to punch, they're just going to tap there. All right, we call the CVA tenderness. If there's tenderness there, it's like the tip of a pimple. You just touch it with a very slight touch, they're going to jump. And same thing here. They're just going to jump. Not pound it. Just tap it. All right? That's how, and we'll say that there's positive CVA tenderness. And we'll usually describe it in their notes. Okay? So there's the outside of the kidney. All right? Nothing really to say. You see the adrenal gland up there. Now, inside is a different story. Okay? We have, um, just to show you over here, um, there's an outside capsule of the whole kidney, all right? That's the outside capsule. The capsule itself, the connective tissue, it's just holding the whole kidney together. happening over here, okay? This portion over here is what we call the renal cortex, okay? Then when we're starting to involve these, you see these little triangular things, I've got a picture of it, these triangular-like things, these are the renal pyramids. The cortex is superficial to that, the renal medulla includes these pyramids. Does that make sense? 
urine is made in the cortex and the um, and the medulla. We're going to get into that. When the urine's made, then they're going to go into what we call calyxes. What we have over here is this is a minor calyx C. Here's a minor calyx C. But when they fuse into one, that's called a major calyx. The calyx, these major calyx C's will then go into the renal pelvis, which eventually will go down into the urine. Okay, questions about that? Pretty straightforward. All right, there's also another picture here showing the same thing. All right, so again, this is this area here is the renal cortex. The renal medulla is this, including those renal pyramids. Urine is made in the renal medulla and the cortex, and things called nephrons. Then the, the urine goes through the minor calyxes into the major calyxes, and they all dump into the renal pelvis, and then it goes down into the ureter. Is that that's pretty straightforward. Anatomy, I don't think any students really have any issues with that. Okay? But you got models here that would show that. All right? In, in practical exams. Right? This is just showing you on a perspective if we cut through the kidney, how they're actually put together over here. So you can see that. All right? More three dimensional. Now, blood supply to the kidneys about 25% of your cardiac output goes to the kidney. Okay. If you go back to circulation, we talked about where the cardiac uh, output goes to, come, or goes to, right? 100% of it goes from the right atrium or the right ventricle into the lungs. But once it leaves the left ventricle, then it goes in diff different places, right, throughout your whole body. Well, 25% of that cardiac output is going to go to the kidneys. Okay. Other places go to muscles, go to muscles. Go back on that. You'll to review that. So basically, it goes arterial blood flow to venous blood flow. All right? And what we got over here is the aorta goes to the renal artery. That's old news to you guys. And then segmental, global, blah, 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 until you get over here. I'm going to make this easier for you. Don't worry about these. Fair enough? All right? We just don't have good models showing all that. So what I want you to understand is that the aorta goes to the renal artery, old news. It does a few other arteries, but then eventually it's going to go to an afferent arterial. The afferent arterial is then going to go into this network of capillaries. It looks like a bowl of yarn, and we call it a glomerulus. Then from the glomerulus, which are capillaries, it goes back to an arterial called an efferent arterial. Does that make sense, going from a capillary to an arterial? Make sense? No, it makes absolutely no sense. Where This makes sense, an arterial going to a capillary. But where have you ever seen a capillary going to an arterial? That capillary should go to a venule. But this is a very unique situation, and it works beautifully. And I'll tell you why. There's sphincters here. There's a sphincter here. So look what's going to happen here. See, venules don't have sphincters. Arterials do. We could put a sphincter there. We could open up the sphincter and let more blood get into here, which is going to go into our kidney. We can take the sphincter here, open that up, and it'll pass through here quite rapidly. Or we can close this a little bit, allowing more pressure to build up in the glomerulus so that more fluid can go out that way. You've got a valve here and a valve here, so to say. And we can control that, allowing more fluid going to the kidney or not. Does that make sense? You can't do that with a venule. This works out. We've seen something similar but different with another system, a venous system, called the hepatic portal system. Right? Going way back, the horse with the big head, right? In that case, we want capillaries to veins back to capillaries. This one goes an arterial to capillaries to arterial. A lot of teachers across the globe like to ask a question about that, an essay question. Compare and contrast the blood flow through the kidney and the hepatic portal system. And there's differences, but there's also similarities. I wouldn't ask you an essay question, 
like this. Sure as heck actually ask a multiple choice question on something like that. One and three are correct, two and four, and so forth. You know that. Okay? Then the arterioles go back to capillaries. We call these peritubular capillaries. And then it has a series of veins that it goes through back to a, um, a renal vein and an inferior vena cava. Okay? Questions about how that's set up? It's not too bad. Okay. So like I said, it's a unique blood system. Compare and contrast it with a hepatic portal system. Okay? And you can see all the blood flows going through. Again, disregard the arteries that I crossed off, but if you, you want to see them in a different view. All right? Um, okay. The ureters are about 12 inches long on each side. They lead, they, they connect the kidneys to the urinary bladder. Where it gets into the urinary bladder, there's little orifices that they enter, and they're called the urethral orifices. Okay? The way that the urine goes down the ureters is through prosolysis. It's milky, there's smooth muscle around the ureters that'll help milk the uh, urine down to, um, to, the, to the kidney. Okay? Straightforward on that. And by the way, epithelial uh, tissue in the ureters is going to be transitional. They change shape, right? So that's transitional epithelium in the ureter. Okay? The urinary bladder, the only thing it's going to do is it's going to store urine. That's it. Okay? Um, the top of the Urinary bladder is what we call the fundus. Here's where the two ureters come in, and this is where the urethra comes out. Now, there is something here called a trigone that you should know. Uh, I wish I had a model of this. So basically what's happening here, it looks like it's up, but really this triangle called the trigone, which is basically where the two ureters come in and where the urethra begins, you have this trigone. That is the most inferior portion of the urinary bladder. So if there's ever any a few drops of urine in the urinary bladder, it's going to sit in that trigone. So that trigone is the area that gets exposed to any kind of toxins most, uh, it, it's, it's mostly exposed to any kind of toxins that come into your urinary bladder as opposed to the rest of the urinary bladder. Does that make sense? This is the part, even if you have a few drops, it's gonna sit in there. So this is the place that there's toxins, that there's carcinogens that can cause cancer. This is the area that we usually see mostly where infections occur. We usually see this where urinary bladder cancer occurs because this is where it's mostly exposed to those things. So when a doctor or whoever's doing, let's say, a cystoscopy where they're putting a scope in the urinary bladder, they're going to mention the trigone, the trigone is cleared of all sites of uh, disease. Right? They've got to mention that because that's the most common place that you'll see that. Because it's the lowest portion, the most inferior portion of the urinary bladder. Is that clear about that? Okay. Like I said, I wish I had a model that you could see what I mean by the most inferior, but if you understand the words, it's fine. Okay. Uh, so there's three layers of the bladder, the urinary bladder. Uh, we have the transitional epithelium, as much as we saw that with the ureters, we also have that. It changes shape to accommodate the urine there. Okay? It's a thin, it has outside of it a, a smooth muscle we have no control about. It's called the detrusor muscle. Alright? You need to, when you pee, you start to pee. You can hold in your pee because you have a sphincter that's at the urethra and you tighten it so you don't go right now when you're hearing me talk. Once you sit on the toilet bowl, you open that up, and then you don't need to think about it because the detrusor muscle, the smooth muscle, that's going to continue to contract by itself to squeeze out the rest of the urine. Sometimes that detrusor muscle contracts when it shouldn't even be doing that. That's called an irritable, um, an irritable bladder. So sometimes it'll just squeeze like that. And we need to fix that in people. That can cause incontinence. So they have medications to actually inhibit that detrusor muscle from doing that. And you've probably heard of these medications because they're on the TV all the time. They call them Detrol or Ditropan because they refer to the detrusor muscle. That's why they're calling it those. Okay? But that's what that is. Okay? And then there's an outer adventitia or connective tissue to hold the whole thing together. Alright, so 
So it's basically doing that. All right, so you have the outer layer here, the connective tissue that kind of holds it all together. There's your detrusor muscle, and then you're going to have the transitional epithelium that changes shape, all right, to accommodate more urine there. It's like a, each one of the cells in transitional uh, epithelium is like a big poofy pillow. You put your head down in it, it kind of contorts to your head, and you pick your head up, and it goes right back to the poofiness. That's what these cells are doing. They're transitional. They change shape just for a temporary basis. Okay? Okay, the urethra. Okay? Connects the urinary bladder to the outside world. All right? There is an internal sphincter that you have no control about, and there's an external sphincter that you do have control about. And it's very similar to the anal sphincter that we talked about in the digestive system. So what happens here is that when urine gets to the internal sphincter, it opens up and you feel that happen by having the urge to go to the bathroom. So you are able to control the ex external sphincter and compress against the internal sphincter so that urine doesn't come out. The external sphincter takes a while for you to train. It takes like three years or so. That's why kids are not potty trained until like three, three and a half years old. The opening of the urethra is known as the meatus. Okay? So if we have males that have a relatively long urethra for obvious reasons, in fact it's seven to eight inches long. Now, we're in anatomy class and I just want to tell you that does not mean that the penis on average is seven to eight inches long. What I'm saying is, is that the urethra is seven to eight inches long. But let me just ask you, what is the average uh, length of a penis. What did you say? Six to ten inches? Six to ten inches? I don't think so. <laughs> now, five and a half inches. All right, that's the average length. So if I'm saying the urethra on average is seven to eight inches, that means that the penis is five and a half inches. Part of the urethra is inside the body. Does that make sense? So let me show you what's going on here. All right. Here's the urinary bladder. And here's the urethra. Okay? In a male. Now, we have a few things going on here. We have the prostate gland, which we'll talk about later. We also have a muscle called the levator ani muscle. And then we have the penis. Now, there's different parts of the urethra you should know about. This is the prosthetic urethra. This part here where the muscle is, levator ani muscle, that's called the membranous urethra. And then you've got the penile urethra. So this is what I'm saying is five and a half inches. But you have another two and a half or so inches still inside the body. Does that make sense? Now here we've got a little issue here. As those guys get older, the prostate gets enlarged. This is what happens. But look what's going to happen here. As the prostate enlarges, it enlarges this way. But it also enlarges this way, too. And when it does, it's going to press against the urethra. And when there's an enlarged prostate, these men have issues where the urine doesn't come out with an even flow. It dribbles out because there's some kind of pressure against here. They have to go to the bathroom often, but what comes out is very little because of the pressure here. Does that make sense? Okay? So that's what I want to say about that. Okay? Now, females are a little bit different. Females is this. That's it. See the difference? They don't have a prostate. They do have a levator ani muscle over here.
But then the meatus, remember what's over here, is the vagina. It's very, very short in a female. It's only about one or two inches long. And because of the short length of the urethra here, they have another issue that we have to understand. They are more prone to getting urinary tract infections. The vagina is loaded with bacteria. Okay? It's loaded with bacteria for different reasons that we're going to talk about later on. Well, some of that bacteria can easily go right up the short urethra and settle in the urinary bladder. That urinary bladder has urine and bacteria love urine. Oh boy, they just party hardy in there. It's great for them to colonize and they make more and more and more. So they are at increased risk of getting urinary tract infections because of the short urethra. Can men get yeah, I mean, the penis is a dirty organ. There's, out here, it's loaded with bacteria. But here's the difference. The bacteria need to come up here. And as it comes up here, after about eight hours, the man is going to pee and wash it away. You see? Here, it's very short. It's fleshy. All right? Can men get urinary tract infections? Yeah. When the prostate's enlarged, because now they're not going to be peeing as much, so it's going to be able to climb up there quite easily. So older men usually get more urinary tract infections than younger. Does that make sense? Can you visualize this? All right? They can apply this stuff, OK? And that's what's happening. So it's just what I just drew for you. Here's the male, and here's the female in different parts, OK? Now, urination, all right? We have different ways that we call it that. Did you urinate today? Did you micturate today? All right, you'll hear that often when you get into the medical field, so they'll say micturation. Diuresis, voiding, passing water, say to a patient, how does the water work? So apparently they understand that too. All right, so there's other ways you could say it. Now, this is what happens with urination, similar to defecation also when you're uh, moving your bowels. Similar. In this case, the urinary bladder fills. The bladder is then stretched. The stretching receptors are then going to send a message to the brain saying, hey, look, we're getting pretty full here. And the brain is then going to send a message to the internal sphincter to open up. Okay? When this happens, it presses on the external sphincter that you have control about. And when does this happen? When about 200 milliliters of urine is there. That's very little. Okay? I mean, your urinary bladder should still hold about 1,200 to 1,500 milliliters of urine. So it's at 200 liters. That's the feeling that, like, I gotta go to the bathroom, but I can hold off a bit, right? You know what I'm talking about. We could talk physiology. You could just nod your head. I know what you're, you go through the same thing with me. But that's what happens but you could hold on to the urine for a longer time because that's only a small percentage that gets filled. Then when you have the opportune moment to go to the bathroom, ER, bathroom, then you just open up your, you know, you have control of the external sphincter, you open that up and just let this atrusor muscle just do its work and just say, thank God for gravity and just go right into the toilet, okay? 